So um, um, the issue, of course, um, I mean, as, as we said, the issue uh, today will not be on prostitution and human trafficking. We know that there are diverse uh, uh, views on that. Uh, what we know is that um, uh, answers to to, to prostitution are not automatically also answers to, to human trafficking, so we have to, to look very careful at what is going on, and, and, and we need to know to see, because otherwise we go nowhere. So again, thank you very much. And now, without further delay, we, because we are already delayed, we come to our uh, first panel. Um, uh, just, just one more word. I mean, wh what we would like to discuss is, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, we have experts here uh, who know a lot of I, uh, about IT systems and, and what this means. This is, the, so to say, the, the, the basis to understand a little bit. Uh, we must admit that we do not know much or not many or not, 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 not too many uh, know much about this, so we are very pleased uh, to have the experts here. And on the other hand, uh, we would also like, of course, uh, to look at human trafficking. What does it mean? You know, has, it, has it changed? You know, has it changed uh, the way we address it? Uh, has it changed the way of, of, of traffickers? Has it changed the, the, the way of victims? And of course, you know, with all, the, all of what we produce, we have also uh, somebody here who will tell us about an app, you know, uh, which uh, is, has mm, become an interesting uh, tool, but we have also somebody, uh, somebody here who would uh, speak about the dangers, you know, to, to have all this data available and to draw conclusions about it. This has always, from the beginning on, it was a problem um, uh, and, and the challenge to look at data and, and what to do with it and how to interpret it. Yeah? We had, at the beginning also, we saw that law enforcement didn't really like you know, to share data they had with, uh, with the data of NGOs. We know that NGOs had um, different uh, data uh, to uh, security people, etc., etc. So this is an issue even more acute uh, in, in um, the time of the, of the digital age. And um, so therefore, I would like to introduce and ask the, the, the experts uh, to come here to the floor. I would like uh, to call upon uh, Kirill Sharapov. He is a professor at uh, the Edinburgh Napier University. And uh, we ask the experts also to give us one sentence, you know, one provocative sentence. And so please take your seat. And uh, we we, uh, for the moment, and then you can also uh, uh, take the micro here. Uh, and he said, and, and I like this very much, from ignorance production towards better understanding of and engagement with human trafficking related aspects of online spaces and internet networks. Because uh, what is really the case, I mean, we have been dealing with the issue of human trafficking for so many years, and we must admit that we have, of course, things have changed, but we must admit that we have not really reached what we wanted to reach, to diminish yeah, or even to eradicate human trafficking. So we, we must reflect and we must say, well, there's something wrong. Could we do? I mean, you won't be the, the only one to tell us what to do and then the problem is solved, but um, he is an excellent researcher. Uh, we have uh, cooperated uh, for several years already, and um, so um, this will be most interesting. He will give uh, the first introduction. Let me just say who else will be at, at the panel and, and ask the others to come here. Then we have Anne Charlotte uh, Nigat, uh, Lotta. Uh, she is the program uh, manager of uh, the Fundamental Rights uh, Agency, the FRA, as is program, program agent, um, manager of Freedom and Justice Department. And um, she said as uh, the main sentence, um, IT systems and protection of victims of human trafficking, risks and opportunities. So th we will hear from, for her from, uh, hear from her side um, about uh, both risks and opportunities. And then we would like to discuss with um, uh, Cristina Cangas Punta, if I may say so, an old friend uh, and, and um, a partner, uh, and uh, we cooperate for many years uh, together. She's the head of the Global Report on Trafficking in Persons of the uh, UNODC, of the UN. Um, and this is important important, you know, because uh, at least we have a, a, a global view 
on what is going on on anti trafficking and, and uh, on trafficking. So thank you very much. And we have uh, Rado Kukos, uh, the Assistant Officer on Combating Trafficking Human Beings of the OSC. Uh, uh, he uh, is uh, a diplomat uh, from, um, uh, from 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 uh, from from the beginning, let's say, but and, and comes from Moldova. Uh, has done a lot in Moldova to establish uh, uh, the the mechanisms and the IT systems uh, on this issue. And um, he said, and this is also most interesting um, to hear than more uh, from him about that turning liability into an asset by using technology to fight human trafficking. So we will see if this is possible and in which way it is, uh, it will be uh, possible. So Kirill, you have the floor. You can also come here if you want. It depends, you can, but you can also stay uh, as you like. Okay. Um, is it on? Yeah. Thanks very much for inviting me, Helga. Um, as Helga mentioned, I come from the university, so I'll give a bit of a probably theoretical introduction and raise some of perhaps controversial points in discussing uh, or in setting the context for today's discussion. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to give some theoretical background to whatever I have to say about uh, online world, the internet, and how trafficking is now represented as the problem uh, interlinked with the internet. Uh, for a long time, um, many people believed and still believe that Western Europe spawned and then spread globally um, a regime of power, the way we control people politically and economically, best described as biopolitics. And in my work and um, many others who research in this area, I draw on Foucault who described biopolitics as a set of mechanisms through which the basic biological features of the human species became the object of a political strategy, of a general strategy of power. Uh, prior to this, uh, in the age of the European kings, a very different formation of power, a different way to control people existed, and this power was described as sovereign power. It was defined by the public uh, performance of the right to kill or to let leave, and it was done obviously by the sovereign, by the king, and the apparatus that surrounded them. Uh, this was the regime which was enacted over tortured, disemboweled, and hacked bodies of humans, and sometimes of cats. And I am referring here to a famous work by Robert Darnton, The Great Cat Massacre and Other Episodes in French Cultural History in which he describes how the apprentice printers who lived in Paris in 1730s slaughtered their master's cats to distress their masters. And Darnton interprets this as an early form of workers' protest. The Industrial Revolution gave rise to another type of power, disciplinary power, exercised by prisons, barracks, schools, and hospitals. And again, something that is fairly obvious in modern anti-trafficking discourses, imprisoned criminals and illegal immigrants or lying, ungenuine victims, and rescued genuine victims through the provision of support delivered via certain institutions. So with all of this, the common end, sorry, I'm trying to keep the microphone so close to my mouth. Um, gave rise to, uh, sorry, common end of society has been control. And while disciplinary power is obvious, Foucault argued that the unspeakable or unnoticed has come more and more under supervision. And he argued, and here's the controversial bit, that as a manifestation of biopower, four figures emerged. The hysterical woman, the masturbating child, the Malthusian couple, and that the perverse adult. And again, thinking about trafficking, looking at how uh, anti-trafficking is organized in different countries, including the US or countries which take the um, prostitution equals human trafficking stance, these figures are still present in some of the anti-trafficking discourses. And briefly, to give you the kind of flavor of what the Foucault meant by all of this, the hysterical woman was saturated with sexuality 
medical pathology and her role in the family life and bringing up children. The masturbating child, and some argue that the current regimes for child protection really result from this type of power, was linked to what was perceived as unnatural indulgence of children in sexual practices and the need to control it. The Malthusian couple was about economic pressures to limit one's sexuality to a monogamous, heterosexual relationship and practice birth control, and the perverse adult was created through the identification of a sexual instinct with biological and psychiatric components. So for Foucault, each of these forms are a certain way of imprisoning or institutionalizing activities, which earlier went along quite generally and were quite, and quite happily. But the imprisoning, and this is something that brings me to the topic of today's discussion, is not done in prisons. It's done largely by ourselves, and it is also described as governing at a distance. So we control our behaviors and we discipline those who do not. And I use the, um, to introduce the notion of network, I use the quote from uh, a Dutch researcher, Goyed, I don't have it in my script, and she is describing network as a security tool, as something deeply problematic, because it has the ability to endlessly generate investigative leads, and because ultimately it has no outside. So network is something that has no beginning and it has no end, which makes policing or controlling it quite difficult. Security actions pursued through network calculations allow the pursuit of suspects increasingly further removed from acts of violence, loosely affiliated with plots and without clear causal roles in violent effects. Through weak ties and distant connections, there is no natural outside to the network, and it may render entire communities suspect. In 2012, the EU strategy towards the eradication of trafficking in human beings defines the recruitment of victims of trafficking in human beings and advertising of their services on the internet as an emergent pattern, even though very little systematic evidence is available to back up this claim. Similarly, the UK's National Crime Agency in 2014 highlighted the use of online dating, social media sites, and advertising of jobs on the internet to recruit victims without referencing any data or evidence. I argue in my work that such developments represent a new phase in largely inept and crime border-centered European anti-trafficking regime. Why? Because such interpretation of problem fundamentally changes the nature of our spatial relationship between human trafficking, criminals, victims, and governments. The state in saying that trafficking is there when we open up our computers on a daily basis securitizes everyday life in response to the assumed, it's not proven, it's only assumed, totalizing power of the newly identified and omnipresent threat of online trafficking. Victims are ready to jump upon us from the screen, they can be bought on the internet, and criminals are ready to take advantage of our vulnerabilities kidnap and sell us into modern-day slavery, or sell modern-day slaves or cyber slaves to us. So, a formerly passive from this perspective online user, who most of us are, whose online movements and communications are now increasingly recorded by internet service providers and intercepted on a routine basis by security agencies, is now continuously encouraged to speak up as she becomes immersed in open online networks that are increasingly regulated at both technical and political levels. I argue that there is a need to think of trafficking not as something extraordinary, but as a human activity, a human thing, cultural in nature and the product of the social order in which we live at any particular historical moment. So the trend to represent trafficking as real and everyday, yet intangible threat that lurks behind the screens of our devices is enabled by focusing on a very specific individualized transaction between the two, a particular criminal, and normally it comes with a range of stereoty stereotypes, white or non-white male, 
predatory, middle-aged. So lots of literature on that, how criminals are represented in anti-trafficking discourse and victims. And of course, normally, and there is research available on this, victims in the public understanding and in the media discourse are represented as white young women trafficked for sexual exploitations. exploitation. So the question for me should not be why there are exploitative jobs advertised on the internet, but why they're attractive to a reserve army of labor who Bordeaux described as made docile by insecure employment and the permanent threat of unemployment. My argument is that we need to have more nuanced and grounded ways of understanding how different online spaces mediate engagements with crime, sex, exploitations, and other aspects of our everyday life. The European Cybercrime Center, EC3, uh, says that cybercrime exists in an ethereal alternate dimension. But it's not true because it still exists in a physical dimension as well. The EC3 is correct to note that computing power and connectivity have been increasing at an impressive pace. However, as such, it doesn't give us the liberation from logistical constraints of the physical world. Exploitation still takes place in the physical world, and it happens because it makes sense, whether it's economic sense or other, something that uh, we are still kind of grappling with. So, such work, just a little bit, a um, few minutes left. Such work to materialize the internet is important. If we think of cybercrime and trafficking as ethereal and everywhere, victims and perpetrators can be perceived as increasingly close to everyday life. So we have a new type of governance where citizens are expected to self-regulate their engagement with such risks. It also means that the rescue industry can now move beyond a focus on abuse in particular locations in order to find victims and abusers, which this kind of over-focus on the internet represents as always and everywhere. Online networks are changing ways in which trafficking is organized and create new risks and problems. That is absolutely the case. But a fear which is focused on a modern slavery or cyber slavery that is somehow always and everywhere is not a helpful response. The securitization which is associated with this changes everyday life in harmful ways and is not likely to be an effective response to trafficking or exploitation. Rather than panicked attempts to police online spaces, which include attempts especially in the, in the United States, to remove or heavily censor much or most sexual content on the internet, there is a need for more nuanced approaches. Meaningful anti-trafficking action cannot just be about challenging individual deviants or about states seeking new ways to control target populations, meaning us. Instead, what is needed is a much broader challenge to the systems and the everyday practices through which exploitation is still taking place. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we will just thank you, please. <laughs> yeah, we will discuss it further. And by the way, let me just mention we also because one one chair is uh, free here, uh, it's empty. Let's say we had also envisaged to have somebody. Um, uh, from law enforcement to tell us about uh, more about cybercrime, you know, and, and online child exploitation. But, and we looked at, at the um, European level, at the um, also Interpol, Europol, and, and then finally we came to an expert uh, also in Austria. But bureaucracy is, um, in this regard, um, uh, very, uh, yeah, very heavy, let's say. So, uh, and maybe there are also some, some, some is also some reluctance, you know. 
to tell about, uh, about this issue, what is going on. So maybe next time we will stick to the issue, but this time uh, we uh, miss the, the so-called cybercrime uh, expert, but we have at least um, the Austrian uh, expert just sent uh, the brother at least, you know, to, uh, to our meeting also to, to report. This is an, an important issue also. So thank you very much and we will discuss it anyway further. So I um, would like now um, uh, to ask um, Lotta uh, from the Fundamental Rights Agency um, uh, to tell us what are the risks and opportunities of um, IT uh, systems and, and, and is this, uh, this is of course more than just internet. Maybe you can uh, tell us, uh, introduce uh, this to us and, and make clear what the issue is. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, please, please, you can come here. Yes, yes. I leave it here. Thank you very much, Helga, for the invitation and also uh, for the interesting topic of, of today. Um, I will speak about the digital information, but not digital information in internet, but digital information at it, is it, it, it occurs in the EU IT systems and how it could be relevant for victims of crime, including victims of trafficking of human beings and also in, in the fight against trafficking human beings. I will start by saying a few words about the systems itself, uh, because there's, there, it's something which is perceived as very technical, but the importance for the whole management on, on the migration security areas is, is less, less known, actually. Uh, I will second uh, then go into a few into bit into opportunities and risks that we have seen in the work of the FRA on this issue uh, but before concluding then with our recommendations and how the EU president presently trying to take uh, take some of the, the work further in the in, in the reforms of the EU IT systems. Uh, so first, there are some drivers that cut horizontally through all. Um, all the systems. Uh, this is the fact that they're increasingly lying on, relying on biometrics, um, fingerprints as well as facial image. Secondly, they're used for multiple purposes, so not only for asylum, uh, which is, would be the case in, in Eurodoc, but horizontally to apprehend irregular migrants and also for law enforcement purposes. And this is, of course, when the fight against trafficking and protection of victims from trafficking comes in. Uh, we have seen intense developments in, in these fields in the past few years. When Star France started the work uh, uh, a few years back, we had the uh, Eurodac, the Schengen Information System, and the Visa Information Systems. Now we have new uh, proposals uh, put on the table for all these systems. In addition, new regulations have been adopted for the entry-exit system, and the European Travel Information and Authorization System, as well as ECRIS-TCN, which is a, a, a criminal records for, for third country nationals, or fingerprints of third country nationals holding, uh, holding um, records, such criminal records. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, I will do that. Yes. Um, in addition, we have the interoperability proposals will, that will basically revamp the way the system works. They were proposed essentially to, um, to, to combat identity fraud and be, to be able to establish the correct identity of the person. At that point, Fra has pointed out that a reason for a multiple identity may have many reasons and not necessarily be originating in any ill intent of the person concerned. So, to the point, when being used for law enforcement, EU IT system can also be used to identify, identify victims of crime, including THB victims. What our research found is all more confirmed uh, a previous understanding is that the focus is on the criminal investigation, not on the victims. Um, the Schengen information is here the important database. It allows for registering alerts for missing persons, which could include victims of crime. Now, let's first look at the opportunities on the use of um, CIS, the Schengen information systems. Um, in all the six member states where we covered uh, through the field research, um, 
it, it, those that we interviewed confirmed that CIS has been relevant for identifying missing persons, including victims of crime, such as DHB uh, victims. Uh, Polish officers said, for instance, that um, they were able to identify a woman who was suspected of having committed a document fraud, but she was actually a victim of trafficking for uh, sexual exploitation. Another officer from Germany uh, mentioned that persons frequently registered in CIS in VIS as visa sponsors are checked against criminal registers to rule out that they are um, not linked to organized crimes such as um, trafficking human beings for sexual or labor um, exploitation. Um, CIS includes alerts on known victims, but but in order to profile potential victims of trafficking in human beings, there is a need for human judgment. According to, um, uh, to the anti-trafficking directive, training should be provided to officials that come across victims of potential, um, uh, to potential victims of tra trafficking. Um, uh, these are then consular staff so that they can better handle such cases. You are, of course, aware that the European Commission and the Council of the Baltic Sea States have produced guidelines to identify victims, uh, which can be applied by consular services and border guards. And member states have organized training seminars for consular start, staff. So these guidelines would increase awareness on how to conduct visa interviews with suspected victims of trafficking, refer victims to providers of medical or psychological support, or issue uh, replacement documents in case the trafficker would have confiscated the original one. Uh, on this point, Fra looked a bit what happened in practice. I would like to get, yes, to the next slide. In the small-scale survey carried out at uh, embassies, consulates, and their service providers. Um, embassies, consulates these days work with service providers to handle the, accept the applications and take the fingerprints. They were asked if special measures were taken um, for suspected victim of trafficking. Uh, we, we see here that one quarter, 25% of the officers at the consulates and embassies took such, such measures, whereas only 8% of the service providers did this. Um, it is, of course, interesting to note, we point that, this out in our uh, report also, that this could reflect um, absence of, 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 of measures to, to tackle such things, but also the fact that they, were, that they didn't come across uh, cases in the, in the embassies' consulates. We also, to contract, we also asked if, if they took measures when it came to generally victims of crime and the victors were then even, even lower, 13% and 3%. DMCP, Diplomatic Mission Consular Posts, so consulates and, and embassies. E, no, uh, these are the service providers. Which I'll, uh, yes. Yes, I, I, I was briefly making a, a reference. It's just just very shortly. Embassies and consulates work with service providers uh, a lot these days. Uh, they uh, take care of the routine work, meaning accepting the application, checking that all the documents are are, are attached to it. Visa applications, yeah, exactly. Shiva Schengen visas. And, uh, and they also take the fingerprints for Schengen visa applicants. Let's now, now we basically spoke about, um, about uh, adults. If we turn to about the children, we also looked at that in the FRA, because the um, phenomenon on missing children is, is an, an issue and abduction of um, children. Um, abduction is typically carried out by the parents or for child trafficking purposes, according to officials interviewed during the, the field search. 
And also our research also showed that children reported as missing are frequently encountered as, at border crossing points. And we asked uh, border guards how often this then uh, happens. Almost a third of the border guards had encountered a child with an alert in CIS as a missing person between one to 10 times over the 12 month period. Some respondents even indicated that it happened more than 10 times or even more than 50 times in the past year. The prevailing opinion among public officials and experts was that use of biometrics and other data stored in databases could contribute to better tracing missing or adopting children. Um, and I will just refer to you about an incident that our um, researchers met at Arlanda Airport in Sweden, among the countries covered. Uh, the data of a child match those of a missing person, and on both occasions, the first line officer double checked the child's identity to make sure that it was not uh, the same person. In one of the instances, the child was traveling alone with an older sibling, and the first officers made a phone call to check uh, the reference um, of, the, of the persons. Uh, so what happened then when a, a child is, is, is found as, 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 and, and, and noted as, as being registered as missing child in CIS? Uh, it is always sent to a second line check, according to 78% of the border guards surveyed. Over half of the border guards said that at least sometimes an inquiry is made with the, with the Sirene office, uh, either at the border guards member states, so the, 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 the where, where, where the situation happens, or in the member states having issued uh, the alert. And about one third said that the child is always handed over to the child uh, protection over authority. So only one third. An officer may suspect that a child may be a victim of a child abduction, even if it has not been issued a CIS alert. This is then back to the same issue as the profiling that, we, that I mentioned during uh, when discussing how, uh, how adults uh, are, are, are dealt with when, when they considered that they could be a, a, a victim of trafficking. Um, the best interest of the child should always be a primary consideration in all actions concerning um, children. This is, this is always said. In the small-scale survey that we carried out at, uh, at the embassies, consulates, and the service providers, staff were asked if special measures were taken in cases of child, suspected cases of child abduction. Only less than one-fifth of the officials and of the consulates and embassies, and 5% of the staff of service providers said that they sometimes take uh, such me measures. As many as one third of the officers said, and two thirds of the staff of service providers said that the me such measures has never been taken. So similarly to uh, when we spoke about a profiling of THB victim, um, it could indeed reflect the absence of such measures, but it also could possibly show a low occurrence of situation of suspected um, child abduction. No, yes, so, so yeah, they, exactly, yes, they could be, could be a suspicion. No, it's a judgment, it's a judgment of the officer. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but as said, this could have two reasons. Either the occurrence is very low or which would be that the measures are not really in place on how to deal with, with such incentive if, if, it, if they come across such a, a situation. Yeah, in, it, it's, it's interesting, it's interesting, yeah. Now, I have now um, spoken a little bit about potential 
possibilities to 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 um, to use as is to alert some missing children, but also the weak follow-up. We have also obvious risks. The more we rely on IT system for um, for alerts on 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 victims of, of trafficking in human being. And there were also concerns raised in our research about relying too much on this. Uh, for this is the survey of one who is in this survey concerns six member states only. Uh, not not all member states say they were uh, yes there was Sweden Belgium Germany Poland Italy and Spain and we looked at at some in, in certain um, third countries we interviewed their their consular uh, officers and embassy personnel. But as I said, it, it needs to be underlined. This is based on a small-scale survey. It is not, it's not a quantitative survey where you um, really shed light on a phenomenon in, in terms of quantity of it. Here we look deeper in, in, in one issue and we ask this question. And to put the context, as I said uh, twi <laughs> twice already, we don't know if it's because there were actually no cases in that, in, 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 in that uh, um, location, or whether indeed there was a lack of um, awareness of how to deal with such, such an issue. Okay, we are going afterwards discussing it further. Yeah, it's probably not only you having some questions. Yeah? Mm. Okay, please, just continue. I, I started to talk about the, the risks which could also occur if you try to rely too much on IT systems uh, when um, trying to design policies to, to, uh, to detect victims of, of tra trafficking. Um, the first risk is the um, risk for unlawful sharing of data. And the awareness of the need to rigorously verify access rights uh, may be limited uh, by some officials, leading to risk for unauthorized access. Um, and this also has been put forward as by uh, some NGOs in the and asylum uh, context that they could imagine that um, their credentials are not uh, properly checked in some instances. In other instances, they might have too, difficulty, too many difficulties to, to, to get to the data. The other one is the, the risk for stigmatization of the, of the victim. Uh, while some officials spoke in favor of increasing access rights uh, to, to, to databases, uh, including um, THB victims, um, others were of the opinion that access rights are enough and should be kept limited uh, because of the risk for um, stigmatization. So a legal proposal on CIS and other databases are being negotiated. Uh, this is what I mentioned. So what could be done to optimize the use of the systems? Um, FRA has been involved in, in, in trying to, to, to provide advice in the, in the drafting of, of, of the proposals and also uh, to the European Parliament, in, uh, Parliament by issuing legal uh, opinions. Um, so CIS, the CIS2 proposal will strengthen the possibility to identify victims of crime through alerts on missing persons, including ch children, and the alert will include uh, biometrics, which was not the case until now. This will mean fingerprints and palm prints, uh, but it could also be um, DNA in certain uh, circumstances. Direct ascend if, if the two, uh, other two are not available. Direct ascendants, descendants or siblings could, in, uh, to, could provide their DNA. Now, this, the proposal also is, includes strict safeguards on the, on the use of, of DNA. Um, Secondly, uh, there are more explicit categories of missing persons. Um, 
it is it, it is add the type children at risk of parental abduction or this is this is proposed in the regular in the in the in the legal proposal um, and also to indicate uh, the type of missing or vulnerable person um, such as an um, unaccompanied child uh, well it's not enough to legislate uh, and this is i think our research and the slides i showed you uh, that uh, they demonstrate this practice will decide uh, alerts need to be first included in the sys and then used and the system need to be used um, fra also found that a couple of member states um, do not register missing children in sys but this is up to the to discretion of the police to register the case. Um, second, we cannot always uh, assume uh, that complicated systems are used by all that should use those systems um, to protect a victim of crime, including a, a, a THB victim. Um, this is something that we noted concerning um, the visa information system that complicated complicated threshold make it, make it sometimes difficult for the authorities to, uh, to use. Um, now, first, um, for police authorities to be able to, to register uh, and to create alert, um, they need to be in contact, usually um, in the case of asylum seekers who go missing with the reception uh, centers. So we have in our, um, in our recommendations, we have, um, we have put forward, we have suggested more effective cooperation mechanism between police and child protection authorities, and also uh, with guardians. And this could also be complemented by tailored training for practitioners who may encounter um, children at risk. Um, when I started to speak, I spoke a bit about the interoperability between the system and how this could help. And they could actually help. Um, it could be done through a particular search interface with limited access to police officers investigating cases of missing or abducting children. This means that if a child would be believed to have been um, reported as missing, interoperability being Eurodac, uh, where we always have the fingerprints, and CIS could support identification of, of the child. In our work um, on this issue, uh, we have to, to demonstrate that the uh, trafficking of of, of the, the, the protection of victims of trafficking um, is, is, is an important uh, issue, that it's relevant enough, because what we proposed with increased access rights, um, increased use of the system, um, may uh, impact on, on uh, data minimization, safeguards, access rights, which are important uh, data protection. Um, in data protection principles. And it is this analysis that uh, we undertake in much of the work uh, we are doing. Um, before closing, um, I will also mention something relating to trafficking uh, that FRA is involved in, but not to the uh, digital life, and that is two focus reports which have been uh, produced in 2018. One is on domestic workers uh, and their um, risk for becoming victims of trafficking, and on labor work of labor inspections inspectors. And a larger comparative report will uh, be issued in 2019. Thank you. Yeah, to be provocative, I would say, well, um, it's a lot for law enforcement, uh, and um, we will see, you know, 
if we can use it further and uh, also being provocative, uh, saying, you know, we, we discuss uh, making photos of children and so now this goes even further, you know, and, and um, uh, all these sort of things. We are going to discuss whether this goes in the right direction and, and where we have to be uh, careful and to see what, what we can do and what we have to do. So I come to uh, Cristina Cangas Punta. Uh, she uh, produces this uh, annual report. Uh, uh, maybe you also use uh, some, um, some, 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 how should I call it, some digital um, uh, means. Um, so what, uh, and, and also here we discuss the limits, of course, you know, you ask certain, um, you ask certain people certain, certain questions and then you um, produce a report. Um, maybe you can also tell, tell us uh, how you do that, where, where are the, the limits uh, of this and what you think uh, about these um, digital uh, activities uh, we start to develop, if we, ca could, if, if we should uh, do more in this regard, or if we should be more careful uh, in using this, etc., etc. Please. Thank you. I don't know whether this... I think this works, yes. Thank you very much, and thank you, Helga, for inviting me. For this event, I'm very happy to uh, be here today and, and discuss these issues. Actually, I prepared something on identification, but I can also speak about our report. That's also very, very fine. So, um, first of all, as said, we are producing this global report on trafficking persons. It's, act it's actually coming out every second year. We have a mandate from the member states through the General Assembly since I'm with the UN. This is very important for us, probably not for you, but for us it is very important. And we do collect information and data from the member states for the report. So we have very traditional methods for um, collecting the data. We use questionnaire, which is a core questionnaire. And then the member states, they do report on the core issues which we are asking from them, which are on the profiles of uh, offenders, the profiles of victims, and, and then the citizenship issues so that we can produce the information on the how, how um, uh, trafficking in person situation profiles in different globally and then in different regions, sub-regions, and then also nationally. We started to actually produce these global reports, or the first report was a bit different already in 2006. Uh, and then we had from 2009 onwards, we have produced uh, a, a global reports so that now we are going to, or current form of global reports, so that now we are going to publish our next report um, this year actually. So we are busy in, in uh, preparing it. On the digital um, uh, world and our global report, I have to say that, the, and, and actually this came um, through also with the, with the previous presentation, but also what you said, Helga, in the beginning, that there is a serious issue of data sharing. So, um, so we, uh, countries are, because we are, we are actually working together with countries, so countries are, ready to uh, report on those issues which are, which as you did like, uh, they, are, they are recording them, reporting them. If we, if we try to have more of an issue which is going beyond their normal administrative reporting, it's very difficult. And this is specifically the case when we try to get information from other organizations. So I was very interested in hearing what the European Union is doing and collecting, but I'm just wondering whether this could be used for research purposes or any other purposes because somehow we have we have faced you know like this these problems of data sharing not only with trafficking in persons uh, research and, and, and data collection, but also I'm heading the whole crime research section and we are doing very much reports on other crime issues. And wherever we turn to, there's always a problem with data sharing. Uh, and and probably there are good reasons for that, but of course when we collect all this data and it's, it stays there. Probably in some cases it is good, but, but also it could be used from the research point of view. Of view. I, I would think that it could be um, um, used also for purposes which are, which are then 
giving information on the, you know, like at different levels on the issue. Um, so, so there are there are our our limits, and and of course there is a it, it's a sort of like a, an issue of of, of um, confidentiality, but but also on privacy. I can understand all that, but but I think also, and this, I'm here provocative probably here that that there are also tools to anonymize the data so that we could then start to use it in a, in a better way for public information and, and, and for, for informing um, uh, people and, and practitioners. And I would like to, now because, because uh, I, I want to speak about, you know, like, um, of, to, to try to summarize a bit, so how digitalization has changed our lives. So me and, and some other people here, we have been in this field for, for such a long time that actually we started before the, the age of the, the, the or time of the digitalizations, if you believe that this time also also existed. So, so uh, when we started to speak about trafficking in persons, for example, the identification happened really, you know, like uh, like or or the the part or biggest or actually the whole part of of trafficking in persons was was happening in streets and you know like invisible place where you can you can physically see people to uh, to be trafficked if if you could see it so so what i would like to say that that what has changed at least on on if we think about the identification uh, of of offenders and victims are uh, and i would like to mention three issues which actually were came out already so one is this visibility so what has happened with the visibility is really quite big change, not on, like you said, not on everything, but parts of the of trafficking persons, they are not so visible, at least as in a physical fa uh, uh, space anymore. They are visible in a digital space because, because in digital space, when you do an, an, some, an action, the trace will be staying there. So in a way, uh, trafficking persons became more hidden for a physical contact, but also more visible if we think about the traces which are left there. So if we think about the identification of, of victims and, um, and offenders, of course for law enforcement this can give a good opportunity to, to increase the identification also for others who are responsible for identifying, but did it. I don't think that there is a research on that, whether we actually had more identification because of, of, of this kind of digital spaces. And I also, I'm not quite sure, I mean, I don't know whether it happened, and I have my doubts, because in order to use this, this digital information, I think you need to have good expertise, you need to have good capacities, and, and you really, needs to know what to do with this data and also the interpretations as was said previously could be whatever so um, so do we have this expertise I think in some countries probably yes but if what we are facing with our global um, uh, uh, picture is that many countries they don't have very much capacities to do anything so I'm really doubtful that the expertise is there globally speaking, to deal with the identification of cases and, and victims. Then what we also need, and this was also mentioned by Lotta, we need awareness. So when we started to work with trafficking persons, it, is, it was mainly, at least in Europe, it was trafficking of women uh, for sexual exploitation. Of course, this, this has changed enormously, so that there is awareness among many, many practitioners and, and people's, people dealing with trafficking persons on also other types of of uh, uh, of, uh, of trafficking in person, so so and other forms of exploitation. So so of course this all all has changed. But you know those people who are now going to see trafficking do the digital lenses. Do they all have this awareness? Do we really be be sure that the that the training is is really reaching those people who are supposed to have the awareness of of uh, uh, of uh, identifying uh, uh, victims and and offenders and, and and whether this this the awareness is there in order to 
to do a, a correct identifications. Because I, I think there are, whether, whether this awareness is there, I think this is, this is a big question also. And then we think about the, the, you know, like those tools which were mentioned already, is that there are, of course, there should be tools for those people who are probably, uh, who are in a position to, to, to see um, victims, and, victims and offenders, but, but then they would need to transfer this information to some other people so, who have a capacity to, to act. So these tools, of course, they might be there, for example, uh, for anonymous uh, 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 reporting, so that even ordinary who, whoever could, could, uh, could pre really be facilitated to report their, their suspicions. However, also in these cases, um, are, is, is there really, are we sure that, that everybody's, re I mean, because, because trafficking is a very, very complicated crime. So, so our suspicions, or those suspicions of, those, of people who do not really know the, the complications of trafficking persons, might lead to, to identifications which might be false identifications, or they might be, you know, like people have suspicious, have suspicious which are putting some groups of people, you know, in, in, a, in a very difficult positions also to continue their, their work. So, so there are also questions which we have not really discussed or solved, at least I, I really didn't see it happening. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's all a little bit, I think that, that we are discussing digitalization, but we don't have really a focused points that we could really put our fingers on and say, okay, this is happening, this is happening. It's all very much on assumptions. And, uh, and, and I think we would need to really carefully look into that beyond, you know, like those, those, those assumptions. And for that, I think it would be very much welcome that we could, we could have shared data so that we could see what's really happening there. So um, I would like to then highlight one last point, if I may. So um, I didn't speak about social media yet, but, but I think it could be included in this discussion. And, and I also spoke about the sort of like from the, from the authorities or, or practitioners' perspective so far. But of course, we also need to see, you know, like what's happening for those people who are probably in, in risk of being trafficking, trafficked. Or, or, or those who are, for example, uh, in a move, they might be migrating and so forth. Uh, this, this, there might be some issues which are connected then with social media. So we did last, actually in la, uh, last June, we published our global uh, study on smuggling of migrants. So this is a bit different topic, but as we all know, smuggling of, of migrants can lead to the situations which, which could easily lead to uh, uh, trafficking in persons because of the vulnerabilities which are connected to smuggling of migrants. So what we also looked into, and, and what was very clear from our research, was that the mi migrants who are, who are moving, uh, they use social media in order to communicate their experiences, so that they actually can warn the others if there are suspicious uh, uh, persons in this field, if they don't trust somebody, but they could also give recommendations if they have had good experiences so that they could actually proceed with their own migration processes. So we also would need to see this not only from our, our perspective, but also what happens to those people who might be in risk and whether these, these uh, uh, different systems and digitalization could be for preventive purposes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is, most interesting. <laughs> this is exactly what we will discuss further afterwards. But let me just come to our uh, last panelist um, here at this panel. Uh, to um, Radu Kukos, um, he's uh, rather on the positive side. He believes that uh, using technology to fight human trafficking um, uh, would um, lead to, let's say, to uh, or, or it could turn it into a positive liability. So uh, please, uh, Kukos, uh, just give us a few thoughts uh, that we can uh, continue discussion. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this event. 
this is a really, really exciting topic, uh, which is of, uh, it's a focus of our office. And I would like to start, but like something interactive. So if I'm a sex buyer uh, on my phone, I have encrypted communication apps. I have a VPN app, which can, hurt, can hide my IP. I have social media. I have live stream apps. I have the Tor browser app, which give you access to the dark web. And if I really try to look for services of live streaming of child sexual abuse, or I want to buy content, videos, photos of child sexual abuse, I don't have to leave this room. I have my phone, which hides my IP, gives me certain an anonymity on the website. I have financial apps. If I want to be more secure, I can buy bitcoins and I can pay for those files and videos and live streams and bitcoins in order to avoid the banking system and be traced in the banking system. So that's possible. I don't have to leave this room. So if I want to, uh, and probably the sexual services or the sexual content I'm going to purchase is from a person or a child who was trafficked. So if you speak about the physical world, I cannot do being in this room, but with this phone and all those apps, I can do that. If I'm a trafficker, not a sex buyer, and I also have the social media apps, I also have the encryption apps, I can go on Facebook and see, take a look at the profiles, and see who lives in my region and study the potential victims and think of a strategy to recruit them. I can also make a fake, fake account on Snapchat or WhatsApp or Facebook and pretend to be a minor and start grooming another minor in order to exploit that minor. So I can do here with my phone, it will take me some time, not as easier as a sex buyer, but as a trafficker, I can already start recruiting victims. Well, if I'm law enforcement, I also have this phone. And I can also make a fake profile on social media and saying I'm a minor and, uh, you know, um, waiting for different requests from different persons. So uh, as a law enforcement, I can also have some kind of anonymity and do an uh, undercover operation on this phone. Of course, I'm simplifying right now, but this is the, the main idea. So this, this is the impact of technology, is that they made it very cheap in terms of effort and in terms of financial costs to enter the uh, trafficking industry, recruit victims, and uh, so this tells us a lot about the business model that technology allows. And this gives you access to the global market. This is shows how it, it, it moves from the city, regional, local market, because in the physical world, you're more or less focused on the local market. But this gives you as access to the global market. So the technology increased exponentially the opportunities uh, in the trafficking, trafficking field. So I'm, all, I'm um, also going to start with like uh, some statistics. Um, so for example, um, the Internet Watch Foundation uh, identified in 2016, so there's a little bit older number, 50, over 57 websites containing uh, child sexual abuse imagery, right? Over 57, and I think this year is going to be even more. And that's the Internet Watch Foundation. There are also some other foundations which work on this and NGOs. Uh, there's a really great NGO in the US which is called Thorn. They also have some statistics 33% of child sex trafficking survivors were advertised online at some point during their trafficking situation. 
And also according to Thorn, 25 million child sexual abuse images reviewed by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children annually. And that's, again, it's some kind of older, uh, older statistic. So uh, you're right that having reliable statistics on uh, trafficking, it's hard, but adding this another layer, uh, being recruited for ICT or exploited in the virtual space adds even more difficulty to having, to having really reliable statistics. But um, this, this shows that this is a problem. Uh, another statistics, for example, uh, before the enactment of the US legislation in, um, in May, the SESTA-FOSTA Act, in the Northern America, uh, there were 100,000 uh, sexual ads uh, published every day daily, 100,000. So this is, shows you how huge you know, the market was. Uh, it's interesting to analyze the statistics, but that's the possibility offered by internet and by technology, because it, it increases the mar market ex exponentially. So what are the current challenges we're facing? So that's the, the high volume, uh, the economies of scale, the amplif amplification of the market. This is the increased in an, an anonymity of traffickers. So uh, let's take the same Tor browser, which is the access to the dark web. It was developed previously for good purposes. So for example, people who want to criticize the politicians, they could do it having the security online anonymity. But traffickers and criminals are using Tor for their own purposes to also have this anonymity online the development of cryptocurrencies, because the transaction on cryptocurrencies, they're public, but you don't see any names, right? Because the wallets of the cryptocurrency and the accounts, it's a just long number, and it's not associated with any name. So this is another challenge for law enforcement, for NGO, and for or all the people who, who, who fight this. Now, we also have new players, a new instrument, so I mentioned about cryptocurrencies. So the, according to a Europol report, 40% of transactions within the criminal organized groups, so between them, was 40% was made in cryptocurrencies. That's a, that's, a huge, that's a huge number. But traffickers and criminals, they also want to turn the cryptocurrencies in cash. And they have to go to certain people in an institution to do it. And this are, is done by cryptocurrency traders, cryptocurrency exchanges. So this is new players coming into the picture. So law enforcement, how did they address this issue? Because you have new, uh, new players. Another challenge is the uh, knowledge gap existing between countries. We have countries that have some kind of a knowledge on how to look at the virtual space how to um, address problems. But unfortunately, we have many, many other countries that don't have this knowledge. And this gap is increasing, increasing all the time. And since this is a global phenomenon, you have to have some kind of a, you know, harmonization and the knowledge, the same knowledge and capabilities all over the world. Uh, also, we have to think about victims' support. Once uh, uh, some uh, sexual content material involving a victim, it's online. It could be there forever. So there's like the risks of const constant stigmatization of the victims. They're always afraid what if a video of a picture will pop up and will this uh, not allow me to get a job or will this you know, be an embarrassment for me? So again, we have to work also on this topic, and I think you mentioned you're gonna have some discussions later on this aspect, which is, which is very good. Another challenge which we, we noted is that what is the virtual, virtual presence of law enforcement and NGOs? So uh, traffickers, they moved to the virtual space. They recruit victims in the virtual space. They explore them in the virtual space. They, they conduct their operation in the virtual space. The question is, did law enforcement and NGOs and all the relevant stakeholders moved to the virtual space? Right? In the physical world, 
police know where are the brothels. Police might know the, the dangerous streets, so they have a presence over there. They have undercover operations. The question is like, do we have this type of presence in the virtual space, and do we have this risk assessment tools and the mitigation tools, and so on. But again, um, we also have uh, uh, op opportunities. So the way um, technology helps uh, traffickers to increase the market and to have access to more victims and to advertise uh, more victims, the same way uh, we, the law enforcement and the NGOs, we can use the same tools to multiply our, our uh, response. So um, I'm gonna give you like a really great example uh, from the US, it's called Project Intercept. And uh, uh, Microsoft developed a chatbots tool for law enforcement. So chatbots, there are robots who talk online. What the police did, they made uh, advertisement on the escort uh, ads uh, on back page in the, uh, in the, before it was closed. And when sex buyers would respond to that ad, a robot would talk to him, and a robot would pretend to be a minor person, and uh, they would have this conversation, and uh, the sex buyer would offer, let's meet somewhere, and you know, I'll pay you for your services. And the robot said, okay, let's meet. But when the, traffic, when the sex buyer went for the meeting, the police was there. But the thing is that these chatbots, they can discuss with 20,000 uh, sex buyers at the same time. So you don't have the capacity in terms of people to talk to a lot of sex buyers at the same time. But this chatbots, so this is a good example of a force multiplier, is like when the technology help police to increase their response and to um, uh, have a, address the, the issue uh, better. At the same time, also part of this project intercept to show you this, the, the, the force multiplier is that uh, also, the law enforcement and NGOs, they also made different ads every day, posted ads on different platforms, and sex buyers would respond to this ad, but then in reply they would say, oh, this is the New York police, it's illegal to, to buy services, uh, prostitution services. And they would do that every day, and they would like, this is a really great deterrent, and it lowers demand in this case. So, you know, this was, and you can do this at a global stage, right? You can put thousands of, uh, thousands of ads and uh, re uh, reduce demand uh, in terms of big numbers. Uh, another uh, opportunity is the openness of the private sector. So uh, there are really great initiatives uh, around the world where the private sector develop different software for facial recognition, for data analysis, and they give the software for free to NGO and law enforcement. So just a good example is the photo DNA developed by Microsoft, is the Spotlight software developed by uh, Thorn. So Google recently, I think two, three weeks ago, um, developed a, a facial recognition and forensic analysis tool that they're giving it for free to law enforcement and to NGOs. And uh, that's great, so uh, uh, we, we, we have to benefit from openness of the private sector. Um, also another opportunity is leveraging the possibility of the financial sector. You know that one of the principles in fighting trafficking human beings is the follow the money principle, right? So there are great initiatives, in the, including in the OC area, where um, uh, state authorities, in partnership with NGOs, have developed trafficking indicators that have been inserted or have been included in, in the uh, financial analysis of transactions. So a great pro project is um, uh, a project developed in Canada by FinTrack, together with Bank of Montreal, so, you know, banks, they have to uh, report suspicion transactions. 
So the Canadians developed indicators for the banking sector and uh, based on those indicators, the um, uh, banks can uh, report possible human trafficking cases. Uh, there are initiatives that are, are, are around the world, but uh, uh, this is a really good practice that you can take a look at. And again, this is a project which works at the global scale, right? Uh, we want IT to be a force multiplier to address trafficking you know, at the global scale and make a difference, not focus on one particular case. So the financial industry, it's the type of industry that can help us fight human trafficking at this global scale. And another opportunity is the uh, le recent uh, legislation on combating trafficking in supply chains. So the US, the UK, Nordic countries, France, the Netherlands, they have adopted legislation by which companies have to prevent trafficking in supply chains. So what does this mean? So if H&M makes this suit and they make it in Vietnam or in Bangladesh or Moldova where I'm from, they have to make sure that the suit is not made by forced labor, child labor or victims of human trafficking. So the legislation mandates them. But there's a challenge, think about a company like H&M, they probably have like 50,000 suppliers around the world. So the question is, how do you uh, prevent human trafficking 50,000 suppliers? Where do you start from? And that's where technology comes in. We have many different initiatives um, uh, focusing around blockchain. So it's a blockchain uh, allows companies to uh, ensure the traceability and provenance of the goods they produce and they can also show the uh, weak links in the, their supply chain uh, focusing on risk areas and using this information you can come with mitigation strategies uh, and again the supply chain legislation created a market market for ICT products so after this legislation was enacted the private sector the software developers came with different products for companies to um, um, uh, analyze the risk of trafficking in their supply chain. And again, supply chain is one of the sectors where you can have this uh, massive response to human trafficking, where you can really make a difference at a global level, not on individual level. Okay, I would like to cut you short a little bit. Uh, I mean, it's, it's most interesting, so uh, please, yeah, just uh, um, uh, a lot of food for thought. And uh, just because on the, on the on trafficking for labor exploitation, so we, we go on also with the next uh, panel a little bit. Um, I understood that, of course, you, you showed what's already there at the criminal side, you know, and um, uh, you, you, you believe that we should um, uh, use, uh, we should do the same than the criminals do, yeah, maybe using it for the, for the good, but we will see if this is possible and how it's possible, because listening to you also, we see, uh, oh, I have the impression we are lagging behind, you know, uh, with regard to the, uh, to the digital uh, possibilities we have, so let's simply discuss it, yeah, it's, it's just yeah. a, a question. Thank you very much. It was uh, most interesting. <laughs> so the floor is open. Um, there's certainly a lot. Evelyn um, Bebel, you said? No. Evelyn, who, who else? Yeah, uh, here behind. Then uh, Evelyn here first. Um, Evelyn Probst, yeah, just introduce yourself, please. Uh, maybe I don't, I don't know everybody, so she's... Uh, Evelyn Probst, I will be on the panel in the evening, this evening, and I, um, we were quite happy that we have a panel about the digital age this time, because in our daily practice as um, a protection center for trafficked women and girls, we are like living in the center of that, how to analyze and how to see how, uh, so let's talk about social, social media, is used to threaten uh, trafficked women and girls. But bef and there is actually my open questions beside of that, that I'm still convinced, and I agree very much with uh, the presentation of Serial. It's, it's real, and it's not happening in the, di in, in the digital world. 
and I'm still not understanding where is the things which are happening when we are talking about trafficking for any forms of exploitation, whether exploitation is happening in a digital world. And I think we have to be very clear that not everything which is a crime is trafficking. If we're talking about child abuse, yes, it's child abuse, but it's not trafficking. So there are forms of child abuse which are trafficking, but others not. And also getting a sex buyer is not getting a trafficker. So we are not talking about then about trafficking, we are talking about prevention and abolitionist perspectives on prostitution. But it's not our field here. So we can debate about if a sex, uh, a sex buyer is a trafficker like it's perceived in certain states of the US, but I think this is not the, ob the object we want to get in the field of anti-trafficking. And I also know this, this project of Canada where they try to trace the money. But do they trace the money of the trafficker? Or do they trace the money of the sex worker who is earning money and sending it somewhere? So again, if we are here in there, we have to be very careful who is the target and whom do we want to criminalize? Do we want to criminalize the sex worker who is money, sending money? Do we want to criminalize um, the, the sex buyer of an adult? Uh, uh, or do we, and do we perceive that as a demand reduction or not? What I'm really concerned about and where we still don't have any uh, methods is what you said, and I think it was the first time when it was raised now here, it is uh, social media as a threat and as a control system of traffickers. It's not recruitment. I, 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 I see, I don't, I, I, I agree very much with you that I think it's via having profiles of, of, of people via social media, it's a lot easier to recruit. But what is really the difference between an internet ad and attracting somebody via the internet due to the old newspaper ad? I don't get it that much. Yeah? What is like out of the perspective of the victim, the real difference on that. But what I know what is real different is what you mentioned, the pictures which are online then and can be used always, all the time. We had a case where Instagram was used <clears throat> and after five minutes of before, uh, the ten minutes before the, the, the poten potential um, traffickers had been arrested, all the photos of the uh, people had been everywhere. So it was used there. So what do we do there? And that's not a problem of NGOs, that's a problem of police. How can they use their knowledge to prevent that and to prevent another crime which is then happening? Because then we are talking about privacy rules, then we are talking about hate speech in the internet, so there's a lot of connection to other definitions of crimes which are used then by traffickers. And I'm really eager to get answers to that. And this is not only for sexual exploitation. That also goes with any form of, of exploitation where these images of the people who are taken can be used to destroy their future life. It's so, um, bearable, thank you very much, uh, just to bear it because it's easier and then we go okay. there. Thank you. Um, my name is Bärbel Uhl. I will talk uh, after lunch a little bit more. But I actually, thank you very much for the ve very interesting panel. And I would like to use some of the, try to the, uh, to transform the theory of Kirill to uh, and, and try to put them into some practical questions. Actually, um, because um, don't we miss? there's something if we only focus on IT solutions to anything now, because I think what you say, if, if we have new um, IT application, for example, to monitor uh, uh, supply chains um, and, and to monitor exploitation in supply chains, um, yes, it's nice maybe to monitor them, but don't we miss their point? We need a social debate, we need a political debate about labor, mig uh, about migrants' workers' rights, about m migration, about um, 
the right to, of migrants, which is in these times um, horrible, at a horrible stage. Um, also, I think that the IT um, solution always looks at, oh, we need to know more, we need to know more this, we need to uh, combine more data sets and we don't need to know this. But on the same hand, we know so much and we just ignore what we know. And I mean, this is currently going on in Europe with the so-called migration crisis, which is a reception crisis, which is a human rights crisis. We know about all the horrible situation in, in, in uh, camps in, in EU member states and, and the plight of migrants. We know about uh, 10,000 people drawing in the Mediterranean Sea. We know that, that they, them also might be com uh, it might be connected also to trafficking cases, but the anti-trafficking community is just silent about it. So I'm, I'm always thinking that um, IT always suggests to us that we have to know more and better da data and people don't share, or governments don't share data. But why don't we stick to that that we know and, and really open up a social and political debate about it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please, have your hand. Just a moment. Then Clara and then you. Hello, my name is Melita Šunjic and I'm coming from the other side from the refugee and migrant research and research on smuggling networks. And what I have seen uh, in the past years is that there is an opening uh, or a, an, an, an enlarging gray area between trafficking and smuggling, especially on the Mediterranean route. So what the end Digital media play a large role there. So what do we see there? People get recruited, pe people recruit a smuggler, so meaning this is going to be a voluntary trans transaction, maybe illegal, but I pay and you take me to Europe. And what is happening along the road, and they say, no, it's costing more. Uh, you will, uh, we cannot take you on. Then these people are taken for ransom. Uh, they, they are being held for ransom. They are sometimes being tortured. What do the smugglers, turning traffickers, do? They take videos and send them via Facebook to the family of the victim and say, see what we're doing to your son or to your daughter. And if you don't pay ransom, uh, more, uh, worse things will happen to him or her. Then we see, especially on Tigrinya websites, because you were talking about the bots and, 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 and digital research. Most of these are in European languages, but the exchanges on trafficking are happening in Tigrinya, in Amharic, in, in Pashto and Dari, where bots don't work. So what's happening then? The families put those videos on their Facebook accounts and say, please help us. We cannot, we don't have enough money to free, to set our daughter or our son free. And then people start collecting, families and friends start collecting money to give to those. And this is not happening in the dark net. This is happening on Facebook and, and it can be seen and, is, and it is, is being seen and it's being monitored. Um, of course, also recruitment of migrants uh, or by smugglers is happening on Facebook, is happening with names, with contact numbers, with, uh, with, with all the details that would be necessary for law enforcement, but in languages that no, law enforcement ne doesn't necessarily look at. And very often these so-called smuggling experiences turn into trafficking experiences. For instance, many, many of the Afghan boys who have been uh, minors, uh, Afghan minors who are being sort of taken in relay from country to country by smugglers. Many of them get uh, sexually abused along the road. So again, something that started as smuggling turns into trafficking, into coercion, into exploitation. Um, these, uh, these, most of these uh, smugglers, the smuggling networks have ads, they are recruiting their, um, their customers through Facebook and this is all visible and this is all out there. So that's the bad side, but I would also like to add from my, um, if, if I get started, it's going to be a co-speech and I'm not 
going to do that, but one little thing, uh, one little new and positive development where also Facebook helps us um, might be a positive note to finish this. Um, since, since many of you are experts in, 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 in trafficking human being issues, you are well aware that there is a well-established network of, of, of trafficking women from a certain area of Nigeria, from Edo State to Europe for forced prostitution. And um, you may equally know that the way how the, the handlers control these women is that they force them to take a very powerful vow, a so-called juju vow, before they leave, uh, which sort of uh, makes them believe that if they do not fulfill their obligation towards the handler, if they stop, if they go to police, if they betray their... Um, uh, what you call it, pimps or whatever, the, the, the people running the prostitution <laughs> rings, then something horrible will happen to them or their families. And this has really kept those women in check over years and years. They suffer because they're afraid that something horrible will happen. And now only recently, the traditional leader of the Edo people, which is the area where these uh, women yeah, come from. I think we all know about that. Yeah. Um, has, uh, and I don't know if you know about that, has now uh, issued a sort of a, a in, in the Islamic world you would call it fatwa, a ruling that these vows are not valid because they were taken on wrong assumptions and that women should not be bound by these vows. And this is spreading like fire through social media of, 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 of Nigerian users. And I really, really hope that we will soon in Europe see Nigerian women coming forward and talking about their fate and talking about being victims of trafficking and being forced for pro to prostitution. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Clara. Clara, then uh, Mr. here, and uh, then um, Federica. <coughs> Clara Skrivankwa from Anti-Slavery International. Just a couple of, just a couple of points and, and, and observations and, and also questions. This is a really fascinating debate and there is a lot that can be said. Um, and interestingly, and just to your I really liked your points about sort of the technology being used by businesses, and I'll talk about it a little bit more uh, this afternoon. And I was just just an observation. I was I was at a conference of one of the big businesses that I work with, in an advisory capacity, and there is a lot that's being discussed around artificial intelligence and the robots that are coming. But one point that we can learn from the private sector is. They have tried a lot of technology and what they have actually, many of them, while there is the whole scare of robots replacing workers, there is also a lot of learning around technology actually cannot replace certain things. So you can have a tool that helps you do something, but that often depends on the quality of the information that goes in first and the verification and the updating of that information. So, you know, a few years ago, when the d digital mm, world was co uh, coming into anti-trafficking, we were talking about joint databases of information and victim management systems, and a lot of those have died because the information there was nobody to put the information in, nobody to update and verify the information. So I think we can learn from that, and particularly from the private sector, from all the supplier databases that a lot of private sector is moving away from now because they actually don't necessarily give you the information that you need. If the people at the beginning and throughout are not verifying them. So I think we need to be very uh, interested in, in the learning of those that have got the resources to, to go with the new technology first. Also on the points that Kirill has made, I think this is really important. What controlling framework is replacing another controlling framework. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people who are trafficked were subject to a controlling framework, we all know they are at risk of being controlled by replacing another framework with, with a protective framework that is controlling as well. And I think that's something to really talk about. But at the same time, we talked about a lot about the horrible things and the traffickers being online and traffickers being on social media. Actually, I would like us to talk a little bit more about technology as a 
source of empowerment and agency, because there is a lot out there, and I'll give you some examples after lunch as well. So I, I would like to hear a bit more about that, so that it's not really just sort of the scary prospect of the dark internet. Um, and my final point is, and that's more on the positive note, is the transparency movement, especially within the, within the business supply chain area, but increasingly, not just in there, also when it comes to public procurement, there is a push for more transparency. And there is a lot of information that actually is transparently available, and I think we, we need to be asking for more of that, and moreover, what we need to do is, is to scrutinize what's out there. Because at the moment, and you, you talked about H&M, and there are others out there that have published lists of factories where they produce stuff. Doesn't stop anybody from us to actually go and, and wait for the workers outside the factory and have a chat with them and say, well, this is what they're saying on their website. Are you really being paid what they say the workers in their supply chains be, are being paid? And that's a really positive way. And the actual thing is the workers often don't know that this information is out there on the website, that there are people who can find out that there are 10,000 workers in this particular uh, factory in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, please introduce yourself because we don't know one another. The name is Gernand. I'm not from the field. In fact, I was an international in the international credit business during my active times, but uh, the subject interests me very much, and I've been kind of surprised by the seeming helplessness in fighting this kind of crime, uh, especially on the European side. Uh, I'd like to object to the Chair's comment on Mr. Coco's speech. He did indeed uh, cover the, the efforts of the police and the successful, largely sex, successful uh, efforts of the police. He described the, the uh, Canadian initiatives, the US, the New York police initiative, and so on. Uh, interesting to me is that whenever these, say, child pornography rings were exposed, and we had a few cases of that type in the last years, the initiative always came, in my perception, always came from the US, from Canada, sometimes maybe from, from the UK even, or from Australia. Uh, the information was then more or less served to the European police authorities, uh, including those of Austria, uh, where many uh, uh, consumers of this type of junk uh, uh, were exposed. I, I'm curious what happened to those offenders in, in, in the European countries. You never learn about that. Uh, but uh, uh, it's in the nature of things that the police will be behind the criminals. I mean, the crime happens before the police learns about it. So much to that point. Uh, uh, Ms. Nygård uh, seemed to say that we need seminars to raise the awareness of, 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 of these, these things for potential offers, uh, 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 victims of uh, uh, human trafficking. Uh, there must be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of those. I, I, did I misunderstand you, or, or, or is there a concept for, for organizing these seminars? It seems to me that the so-called service providers in, in immigration matters and the, the border control people would sorely need seminars to, to raise their awareness. But how do you, how do you instruct the, the victims, potential victims? Mm -hmm. I agree, bodyguards, etc. We also need some <laughs> some uh, seminars to to know what's going on. I mean, for for everybody, really. I mean, for years, you know, there there is uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of activities on on various levels. But I agree, maybe not enough, you know. So we would have to see um, how we how we do that. Yeah, uh, Federica, please. Yes, Federica Marenga, I work for uh, ALC, an NGO in the south of France. We work with, uh, we provide assistance to victims of trafficking, especially Nigerian ones. 
and uh, we try to be in the digital age and uh, a social worker, a colleague, a social worker has an avatar and a fake profile to, to, be, uh, to, to see what happens on Facebook. Uh, in for the Nigerian community and to know what happens and uh, who is uh, a friend of uh, whom. So uh, this is helpful for, uh, for us to, to understand, better understand uh, the community, but we think that Nigerian, um, Nigerian community is uh, very clever and they know when they don't have to use the... Um, the uh, internet and the, the digital uh, uh, tools, especially for the money transferred. They don't use anymore, well, in France, uh, uh, law enforcement tell us that they don't use anymore the, um, the, the, the digital tools to transfer money, but just uh, some men who uh, transfer money with uh, uh, valet or trolleys. Uh, in order to avoid the anti-trafficking um, efforts. So just to share with you this specific uh, example of the Nigerian one, uh, mm -hmm. community. Uh, some more interest on the floor, because then I would go back to the, to the panel and ask the panelists uh, to react on or to, to comment on, on, on everything. So who would, like to, who would like to start? You would like I'll, to start, please. I'll start. I'll start. Good, no? Well, what I wanted to finish my presentation is that um, technology used for trafficking, it's a n not a new form of trafficking. <laughs> uh, and also, um, what I wanted to say is that uh, technology is the easy part, changing mindsets is the difficult part. So uh, basically, technology has to complement our effort, we don't have to forget about the other stuff we're doing on preventing and combating trafficking. We have to use technology to multiply our efforts. Technology doesn't replace the work, you know? Uh, Clara mentioned about uh, companies using technology to, for the supply chain, but technology just gives you information, then we have to work with this information. We have to figure out how to connect it, the dots. And technology doesn't arrest traffickers or saves victims. Technology kind of has to help us to do this. So, you know, uh, we have to look at this in this way, right? Not thinking that technology will, uh, will uh, replace the, the whole work. And, also, uh, there was mentioning like, you know, we have to speak about good practices like at the OEC or currently for the last two years, we have been doing a mapping analysis of the uh, initiatives in using technology to fight trafficking. And we've so far we identified around 200 initiatives around the world. Correctly, it's ma mainly in the US in UK. Uh, uh, in, in, in Canada, we research in different languages, in Russian, French, Spanish, but uh, we, we have this mapping and this 200 initiatives, and now we're looking at, okay, what initiatives are efficient, which are not efficient, which one can be scaled up. Uh, I just gave you some examples during my speech, but if we speak about all the good practices, we need at least two days. So uh, there is positive development and we'll be publishing a report on the f using technology to fight trafficking by the end of this year and we'll gladly share it with, with, with you. We mean the OEC. OEC, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. So, is it working? Yeah. So, uh, I actually want to just, uh, I picked up two points from the discussion. The one was what Berber said. On the on the, that we have enough of data, yes, we do probably in some regions. But you know, when we go to sub-Saharan Africa or some parts of Asia, we definitely do not have enough of data or information. Or probably somebody does have it, but but it's it's very very difficult to to, to reach it or or get it. And and also there are totally different capacities in in some parts of the world to to, to capture this data. So we are speaking 
not always, but in some cases, trafficking is transnational crime. And, and if we only hear, you know, like if we have data from one part, I don't think that we can reach the holistic picture. So, so I think it is important to remember that, that Europe is, is really in a privileged position concerning data, and, but, but then there is the rest of the world where, where the situation is probably not that good. So this is my first point. And the other point, which I sort of like, I have been a bit concerned, and with this discussion I'm even sort of like, my concern is a bit increasing, is that, that we have for many, many years, we have um, um, trying to uh, clarify the concepts so that we would be clear what is trafficking, what is something else, and, and what we are speaking about. I think we are going a bit backwards now. I think when we are putting together a, a, a big amount of, of, of data and nobody really knows actually what it is and, and, and we, we sort of like label it all being trafficking in persons and probably it is, probably it is not, but I think we are a bit sort of like in a, in a darkness there or, or going towards, backwards on, on, the, on the clarification side because, because we then end up to the same situation that everything becomes to be, to, to be, uh, to be trafficking as we probably had some time ago. So, so I think this is also one concern which we would need to look at and, and, and we really would need to sort of like see that we are speaking, that we know what we are speaking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention one of the projects I'm currently involved in with my colleague from Dundee University in Scotland, John Mandel, where we looked at about 250 anti-trafficking apps available for, per not for purchase, for downloading, either from Android or from Google Play or from iOS for Apple users. And so we had a look at 250 of them and most of these apps uh, who are designed obviously for the general public to either report or educate themselves about what human trafficking is. Most of these apps appear to be dormant. So if you look at the number of downloads which, which are available via Google Play for Android uh, operating systems, the actual number of downloads for most of the apps are quite low. Most of these apps were quite expensive to create and in kind of trying to explain this, um, that it's out there but it's not being used, uh, we came across, not we came across, we, we used the concept of interpassivity, which was suggested by the European philosopher Slavoj Žižek. And he used the kind of example that some, I think those who are much younger would not be able to relate to. You remember we had those VCRs where we would leave them and set them at a certain time to record the program on the television where we're not at home. There was no Netflix, there was no um, BBC iPlayer. And of course, in most times, at least me, I would never even go back and look at these programs because I never had time to watch this program in the first place. But the very realization that it's there on the tape and I had a stack of them kind of made me feel happy. So that's what the Zizek is explained by interpassivity, that it's there, <coughs> but it's staying kind of, it, it lays dormant, you're not interacting with it. So with many of these tools, at least, which are directed, at the members of the general public, we are kind of thinking, well, maybe it's the interpassivity. We know that there is something going on. We know there are tools. We know that someone is monitoring, but we don't actually care. Um, so, and also there were questions or um, there were comments about awareness raising. And again, there's very little research available in terms of, well, how much awareness there is and whether awareness translates into action. We all know, well, most people who go to H&M or Primark that, you know, the T-shirt that we buy and that's been discussed many times before for two euros, probably something dodgy would have happened, but really, do I care? People would say so. It's kind of, you know, awareness raising as such should be another probably topic where we need to explore whether we are aware but not active or whether we are not aware and not wanting to be aware. Because again, it goes back to this, uh, what, what I did mention in the presentation, the, the whole kind of study of ignorance and it's called in social sciences, uh, there is a special word for that, agnotology. And the key question in this study of ignorance is, 
why don't we know what we don't know? Whether someone is actually benefiting from us knowing some things, but not knowing the others. So that's again another concept, you know, the ignorance production, which could be applied to, 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 to the kind of the whole business of internet and trafficking and us being the kind of passive users of that. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much. Please, Lotta. Thank you. I, I will start with technology as an, as, as, as an empowering agent and then move on particularly to the, to the question of the limits of technology where human judgment is, is needed because this is really where your question comes in. Now, technology as empowering in the fight against trafficking in human being, this is, this is exactly the, this is the alert in the Schengen information system, which is completely used for that purpose. And these are now enhanced also in the legislative proposals being discussed. The same direction is, is going on in the, the proposal to the visa information system where access by law enforcement, which is generally uh, subject to, 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 to restrictions and, and hurdles, is made more easier if it is uh, a, a matter of, of, of um, trafficking and to protect, protect the victim of, of trafficking. Now, as I also explained, we have the interoperability where in exchange of, of biometrics could, could make it easy to identify uh, a victim of trafficking. Now, there also, we have in the next step, when somebody has gone through the process and perhaps needs a victim of crime, needing a new, new identity, there we have an additional challenges for these IT systems because the biometrics will be the same. Uh, here, it is very important that the officials are, are aware and uh, it, there will be immediately a pop-up in the system that this is a new identity of, of this person. The person is, is protected. Now, where are the limits of, of, of the technology? That where human judgment is definitely needed, this is to, in, in the profiling stage. This is also uh, where uh, the statistics were quite um, bleak, so to say. I think it was also the, the question referred to, to that. And indeed, the, the border guards have also told us that it is difficult. It is just very difficult to know in a few seconds, do you have in, in, in front of you uh, a, a potential trafficking in human beings or a, or a, or a legitimate traveler. And this is something which is, um, Frontex for instance is aware of this and I put some, I put also some effort in, 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 in trying to, to just increase the capacities to, to improve, improve ways. But it is, it is different and this is, this is very the limit of, of technology. Here human judgment is, is necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much um, for this uh, panel. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, you find all the, the material at our website afterwards, so we can read again and, and, and continue on this. And, and you know us, you know, this is just the first, uh, a first moment to discuss it. We will continue and get deeper into the matter. I would really like to thank uh, the, um, the, the panelists. I think it was most interesting for all of us. And now we have a short break until one 30. Please, 130 we have a next, the second uh, highly interesting uh, and highly valuable panel. Thank you very much. <coughs>